Good morning. So I want to I, I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to talk a little bit today about vascular injury. Dr. Dawson, who's not here, suggested that I, you know, I could, I know I confused my presence here confuses a lot of the residents and certainly part of the faculty. I'm covering I cover acute care surgery one week, then I'm on vascular, then I go to the Air Force Base, and then I disappear for two weeks and can't tell you where I've been. So I know it's a confusing uh, paradigm, and so it's kind of hard to get to know folks that way. So I'm going to, uh, based on Dr. Dawson recommended I tell my life story, so I'm going to see if I can do it in a total of uh, three minutes, and we'll see what I do. So I grew up in Texas uh, for education, went to the Univers uh, Virginia Military Institute, and then the University of Virginia. My residency training took place in Biloxi, Mississippi, at Keesler Air Force Base, until a little thunder shower called Hurricane Katrina, which some of you may remember, uh, drowned that place in 20-foot waves with, with me in it, which is an interesting story if we ever have time for that. Went back to University of Virginia to finish my surgical residency at UVA, ultimately to Los Angeles County USC Medical Center for Trauma and Critical Care Fellowship, then back to San Antonio uh, Wilford Hall Medical Center, Level 1 Trauma Center, 59th Medical Group, to ultimately to Baltimore Sea Stars, which is an Air Force detachment stationed at Baltimore Shock Trauma. And then finally to Houston, after deciding to do a vascular fellowship to train at UT Houston for Medical Center, and ultimately to UC Davis. So this is, uh, we're my military residents in the room. This is uh, what you can, if you take the wrong turn in your military career, uh, end up doing. Um, <laughs> and there's been a couple of camping trips uh, that have been paid for by Uncle Sam along the way. Uh, twice to Afghanistan, once to Iraq. I'll be departing this summer, and then I'm already on the books for next summer to locations that I can't really tell you, and if I, I don't know, and if I did, I couldn't tell you. So it's an exciting, it's been an exciting ride, and I chose most of this, so the military lifestyle is not all this raucous. I chose most of my poison along the way, but it's allowed me to really uh, interact with a lot of cool people and uh, learn a lot along the path, and probably I've learned more after training than I ever did in training, and that continues to be the case here, working with Dr. Pevick and the group at, on the vascular side and, and the, uh, my new trauma colleagues. But, you know, I've all, I, for the first part of my career, I envisioned myself as a trauma surgeon. Uh, this is Dr. Dimitrios uh, Dimitriotis on the left. I trained under at L.A. County. Great guy. Um, and I've also had the opportunity to work with Tom Scalia, at, uh, who is a kind of an icon of trauma. He's going to be here in a couple of weeks giving grand rounds. Uh, from Univer uh, University of Maryland Shock Trauma. And I've gotten to do some cool things. I get to salute guys in funny hats along the way, and I've gotten to meet some cool people. How many of the residents know who this is? Chuck Yeager. Well, in, no resident pointed that out. How many residents who know this is? Yeah, that's what's wrong with America. So you, know, you, don't know who Chuck, you don't know who Chuck Yeager is, the man who broke the sound barrier, but you do know who Toby Keith is. And I've actually, through kind of some uh, Forrest Gump-like experiences, I've also been close enough to at least shake hands with a couple of presidents, most recently um, President Obama in 2012. And I've learned a lot of things along the way. There's a lot of differences in practice. This was the sign at the Bagram Clinic that didn't quite get the spelling right. It was supposed to be internal medicine. They have, apparently have a different standard in Arabic in some places. And I've gotten to take care of some really cool people. Luke Neff and I were both shared the, the care of this particular uh, young patient, Najee, uh, who is, uh, um, was a really cool opportunity and a cool kid to take care of and really take care of some of the people that I've really gotten this job to take care of. And that's been my life's work and something I'm very proud of. But this is what I call the slide of the two halves of the trauma surgeon's brain, right? This is what we think about. And this is the way I envision myself. You know, on the left side, the blood and guts. And then all trauma surgeons, my apologies to my colleagues, but I accept this as well, we're all a little quirky. So we all, all trauma surgeons are a little quirky, and, and I think that's a good thing. But along the way, I really became inspired in what I was really interested in. And if you ask any trauma surgeon, what was the best five cases in the last six months? How many of them had a vascular injury element? I see a couple of nodding heads in the, in the audience uh, on, my, on the trauma side. But this is vascular injury is really what's interested me. I love the pathology of it. I love uh, the epidemiology of it, and I love trying to figure out what the right thing to do is. There's a lot of surgical exposures that you really don't utilize commonly for other uh, court cases, and uh, you really have to be facile on a lot of elements of care. And there's a lot going on in vascular injury. I'm not going to be able to touch on everything today, but there's really an evolution in vascular injury management. I'm going to focus very briefly on three major topics, uh, the changing perspectives in blunt thoracic aortic injury, the endovascular evolution, and then ultimately I'm going to touch on and gloss over uh, some of the stuff on Rebo, which is a whole very hot topic in trauma these days. So let's talk first about blunt thoracic aortic injury. Everybody knows it's the second leading cause of death after motor vehicle accident. Most of these patients don't make it to our door. They die on the scene. The majority of our motor vehicle uh, collisions 
And rapid deceleration mechanisms, which are kind of complex if you really scrutinize them, actually account for the majority of the mechanisms here. And we learned a lot about how this transition in care over the last decade or so has taken place from this paper, which was published by Dimitriades and Tom Scalia, who's going to be here in two weeks, is also on this paper. And it really documented in the last decade or so that we've had a transition from traditional angiogram utilization to CTA utilization for diagnosis and a significant improvement in outcomes with transition to the era of endovascular uh, repair or TVAR. Uh, and we've also learned that perhaps delayed repair may be better than immediate repair. So all this, this paper really suggested a lot of that. And if you look at the UT Houston experience, this is the experience from my own uh, fellowship uh, center. If you look at some of the advents in, in uh, technology and approaches that have occurred over the year, uh, from distal aortic perfusion to TVAR, what you see is a mortality reduction in 2% over that time frame from 97 to 2014. And changes in, in care reflect that. The red here is TVAR, the blue is open repair, and the green is non-operative management. So you can see a shift to non-operative management in TVAR over traditional open repair mod modalities. We don't have the 20 or 30 or 40 year data on these patients yet, but if you look at actuarial survival curves, what you can see is that uh, the, the long-term outcomes appear to be just as good with TVAR as open repair. So that's very encouraging over the first 10 years of experience. But, and I think people have a tendency to say, well, TVAR is here. We don't have to think about blunt thoracic aortic injury anymore. But there really is a need for a couple of important things. And one of them is a common nomenclature, uh, one that kind of guides treatment, timing of intervention, and it works across a whole spectrum of injuries uh, that we can employ. Now, to be fair, there is a, a nomenclature that has been developed by the Society for Vascular Surgeons. Uh, some of my mentors were on this paper, which was developed in 2011, dividing blunt thoracic aortic injury, aortic injury into four different grades. And if you look at what they recommended, actually, it wasn't even recommendations. The data wasn't that strong. This is the suggested treatment algorithm for modern treatment according to the SVS from that 2011 document. Grade one treatments undergo medical treatment. Grade two, three, and fours all undergo TVAR. Two and three within 24 hours, and grade fours emergently with, by either open or TVAR repair. But the, one of the questions that's arisen in the last couple of years is, do we really need to be treating all these that we do treat, particularly within 24 hours? Can some of them wait a little bit longer? This is IVUS, or intravascular ultrasound, for those of you not familiar with it, a very cool modality that's utilized in elective vascular practice and emergent practice. On the left is a grade one injury. On the right is a grade two. And particularly for that grade two injury, the question has arisen, do we really need to treat those within 24 hours? The group at Harborview, just up the road, Ben Starnes and others have suggested that probably we don't. If you look at the, subs the outcomes of patients with grade one and grade two Society for Vascular Surgery Guideline uh, aortic injuries, there's really no difference uh, in, in the care, whether you treat them with T-bar or uh, non-operative management, at least in the short term. So maybe these are patients that we can follow up more closely, and those that advance we can then treat. But some of these injuries will probably heal. There's even been some questions that have arisen about grade three injuries, are these pseudoaneurysms. What's the risk for rupture, early rupture between these two? Well, I mean, I think physics would tell us that the one on the right is going to be more likely to rupture and the one on the left is less likely. But will some of these heal? Will all of these progress? Do we need to put a TVAR on all of these patients at least at 24 hours? Probably the early treatment maybe doesn't need to be done for everybody, but certainly uh, we don't have enough information to really say that definitively. And the group at Maryland has suggested uh, that, uh, you know, there are some other prognostic indicators that as vascular surgeons we don't think about quite as much, but other prognostic indicators in terms of the lactate level, the associated injuries that need to be adequately considered to define optimal care for these patients and define their aortic rupture risk. So an optimal grading system would define treatment, right? Medical TVAR open repair it would guide the timing of that treatment uh, beyond what was established in 2001. And more importantly, I, th I don't think we know enough about the natural history and optimal follow-up for this patient population, which is something we need to learn about. And one of the organizations that stepped forward um, that I'm uh, the, uh, proud to be a part of uh, is a nonprofit organization called the Aortic Trauma Foundation. And a couple initiatives here, mainly focusing on research and gathering more information and defining optimal care for blunt thoracic aortic injuries. It's, it's designed to establish a multidisciplinary consortium for trauma leaders in blunt thoracic aortic injury, to establish an international registry, and really hopefully use that data to define some more modernized and contemporary clinical practice guidelines. We started with a couple of efforts through the ATF, uh, the first of which was a retrospective multicenter a study which had not been done since the original Dimitriotti study in 2009. We collected nine ACS level one trauma center uh, uh, data, 
over a five-year time span and got 382 patients. And this, I won't get into the details here. This was presented in 2014 and published in the journal Trauma last year. Uh, of the injuries that we identified in these 382 patients, you can see the majority of them are grade three injuries or pseudoaneurysms, but we really had a full spectrum of injuries we were able to capture. And we looked specifically at a lot of factors. I, can't, I won't touch on all of them for the sake of time here, but when you look at non-operative management patients, non-operative management patients versus repair patients were typically older, more likely to have a lower grade injury, as one would probably expect, and they had less mediastinal hematoma on CTA. That's also pretty obvious. And, but they had a higher overall mortality. And I think this carries home the point that the majority of these patients die with their aortic injury as opposed to from their aortic injury. So we need to consider the entire patient when looking at these films and not get focused in on the uh, aortic injury itself. And an important thing for me was there were really only two failures in modern uh, utilization here in the last, over that five-year time span. And both of those were salvaged with TVAR. So these patients with grade one and grade two injuries really don't die in the hospital and probably can be followed up outpatient as opposed to the current SVS suggestions. What about open repair and TVAR? Open repair still is a, it's a vanishing skill set, but one that is still needed for a subset of patients. About 16% of patients in the contemporary era require open repair. Uh, TVAR patients, when compared to those open repair patients, are typically older, less injured, and as one would expect with somebody who doesn't end up getting a major uh, open surgery, they, get, they require less packed red blood cells and less FFP lower transfusion requirements, one of the attractive elements of TVAR. And when you look at TVAR comparing to open uh, repair, TVAR is associated with overall lower mortality and specifically lower aortic related mortality. And that's been one of the promises of TVAR. This is a busy slide, but again, I'm hammering home the point of these lower grade injuries, grade one and two injuries. And our data from this retrospective study, the largest in the last you know, decade or so, uh, showed that there was no difference in outcomes for these patients, whether they were treated or whether they were managed on operatively. So this suggests that we may be over treating some of these patients as a community at least in the initial phases, but we really need to do some more research to better define this. Uh, another thing that we did that was kind of interesting, we took a survey of contemporary practices. So the retrospective show, study showed what people actually did, and the survey was designed to show what they, we think, what they think they did. Uh, so we were able to gather a cooperation from the Society for Vascular Surgery, the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma, and the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma. And it was pretty interesting. It was about an even number of group of patient of individuals, 398, 400 patient, people from both the trauma and vascular community. And ironically, they both the trauma and vascular surgeons agreed for most of these questions. So there wasn't a significant disparity in the answers given by both. But if you look at how these people uh, who manage these, these are the stakeholders in blunt thoracic aortic injury care. How did they manage these injuries? It's really not based upon the Society for Vascular Surgery guidelines, but really the personal knowledge of the literature and their personal experience. So is there some room to develop some guidelines that can provide and integrate that experience, integrate that, that literature, and better uh, help us optimize outcomes? And there are a lot of disagreements here, a lot of things that we need to settle. We talk about medical management, which is a mainstay of initial treatment, whether you're going to treat the aortic injury or not. You need to control the blood pressure and the stress forces placed upon the aorta. But what are the goals that we utilize? People use mean arterial pressure goals. People use systolic blood pressure goals. And there's a lot of disagreement in both the trauma and vascular communities in that regard. And I'll come back to the grade one and grade two injuries. I hate to beat this drum heavily, but you can see there's significant disagreement about whether these need to be treated with TVAR or whether they need to undergo medical therapy and close follow-up to see if they advance. So ultimately, what we've moved forward with, and this just was unraveled, uh, un unveiled, I should say, last month is uh, we, we developed a multi-center perspective blunt thoracic aortic injury. Uh, this was a centralized online data collection system that was developed in conjunction with the Aortic Trauma Foundation and the American Association for the Surgery Trauma and went live last month. We presently have 14 presently committed centers. You'll see U University of California Davis is one of them. Uh, and we're actually we're now up to, to, I've added two more here in the last month and I anticipate we'll add even more as the word gets out on this entity. Well, that's TVAR for blunt thoracic aortic injury. What about endovascular at other locations? It's very slick. It's very cool. It's one of the reasons why I got into vascular trauma, so I, a vascular fellowship, so I could acquire that skill set. Are there better options, particularly at specific anatomic locations, uh, at least in the short term, uh, for treating traumatic injuries? This is uh, iatrogenia necessitans, or the otherwise known as the medical resident placing dialysis catheter in the subclavian artery. And this was a very sick patient, actually. 
uh, and we were able to very effectively uh, take the patient to our uh, hybrid suite and cover this with a stent to avoid the, the complications that may have ensued in a very sick patient from doing an open surgical procedure. Here's another one. This is trauma, a trauma subclavian artery injury. Again, the, the subclavian axillo subclavian axis makes a lot of sense. There's a highly condensed area of anatomy here. The operative exposures can be complex, particularly to people who are not used to being in that area. And so this provided another nice alternative in this patient with really some significant multi-trauma injuries and a shoulder distraction with basically a complete transection that we were able to come from the groin, come from the arm, uh, snare a wire across the injury in what we call either a rendezvous or a body floss technique and cover this with a stent with good effect. And you know this technology is moving forward. If you look at uh, the literature, this was a very nice study. Bernardino Bronco is uh, now a vascular fellow at UT Houston. At the time of this publication, he was a resident with me at uh, UT Houston. And what he did is he looked at uh, the National Trauma Data Bank, nine-year analysis, over 40,000 injuries, and looked at how many of these injuries, vascular injuries, were treated with endovascular procedures. If you look at 2002, it's 0.3%. 2010, it's 9%. And, and I think those numbers can t continue to grow as we refine and define the areas where these are most uh, useful. And that's probably going to be most likely blunt injuries in many instances. And actually, when he propensity score matched these populations, the endovascular patients had lower in hospital mortality and lower complication rates, particularly the kind of things that you would expect with large open incisions and the burden of open surgery, sepsis and se surgical site infections, at least trends in, that, in those directions. But really, we need more data on this. This is vascular trauma is not a, in some con don't consider it a particularly sexy, sexy field but there are certainly some good single center retrospective series, but they come with single center retrospective limitations. National Trauma Data Bank is a great tool, but really lacks a lot of key detail and has no follow-up data. If you talk about the Society for Vascular Surgery, Vascular Quality Initiative, or v, uh, VQI, great initiative, really designed though to look at peripheral vascular disease, but it does give one year follow-up, but just doesn't ask some of the right questions related to the significant burden of injury and associated injuries, and even the specific management rel related to trauma. So, and there's a lot of unresolved issues in this field that we really don't understand a lot about. We're ta not talking about older atherosclerotic disease patients. We're talking about young patients with small vessels. We really don't know the natural history of some of their injuries. We're talking about the role of anticoagulation and antiplatelet, not in a 65-year-old with femoral disease, but rather a 20-year-old is now going to have to be on Coumadin because they had a stent placed in a very challenging location. And then what is the exact role for endovascular treatment here? Is it a hybrid adjunct? It could be. Is it definitive therapy? It could be. Is it damage control? It could be. And I think the challenge here is to define where is endovascular therapy most optimally utilized within that spectrum for each individual patient. So one of the things that we've done uh, through the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma is establish the really kind of the first comprehensive vascular prospective uh, injury database. And it asks, it combines the best of all the worlds that I talked about with the NTDB and SVS, but asks the specific questions and is designed to capture follow-up. We now have over 1,800 patients in this uh, study, uh, which was approved, a registry which was approved in 2012. It's prospective multi-center observational, captures all patients over the age of two with radiographic or clinical diagnosis of vascular injury and has a linked follow-up module. We presented our initial kind of feasibility report of this. I won't show, show all the data, but I think some of it was pretty intriguing. This was the first year that we collected data from 15 participating level one trauma centers, uh, 542 patients. We're now over 1,800 patients in the registry. And we identified 484 arterial injuries. And these injuries occurred over the full spectrum of the human body. So we were really able to capture, a lot, capture data on a lot of named injuries that hopefully as we move forward, these numbers will grow and we'll be able to answer questions. Some of the specific elements that we look at with this registry include the utilization of damage control modalities. Ligation continues to be the primary damage control modality in the modern era. Shunting is utilized in about 2.6%, but about 10% of patients require some form of damage control in their initial intervention. And definitive management elements, non-operative management, endovascular, open repair, a variety of open repair options. We're capturing all this data, and as we move forward, hopefully we can speak more to outcomes beyond the single center retrospective series. We're going to capture outcomes as well in terms of hospital length of stay, mortality, transfusion requirements. And most importantly, perhaps, the vascular-specific complications that you really can't get from the NTDB 
uh, and some of the other available resources, specifically the thrombosis rates, the infection rates, stroke for cerebrovascular injury treatment, and the need for reintervention and ultimately amputation. So we hope as we move forward, these will become important, this will become an important registry to help answer some of these questions. We have an associated follow-up registry uh, as well, which really the, the, the gaping hole in the trauma data is not the in-hospital data, but actually the long-term outcomes, and we hope to improve on that as we move forward. This registry continues to grow, long-term outcomes are needed, and we just recently received $7 million in DOD funding. Uh, UC Davis is getting some of that for a partial FTE that we're moving forward with, uh, and we have multiple centers that now have partial funding, and we're pursuing additional funding to really uh, improve collaboration across the spectrum. I'm gonna spend the last little bit here uh, to talk about a topic that we kind of touched on and danced around a little bit, resuscitative endovascular occlusion of the aorta, or REBOA. And I know this may not be a topic that's profoundly familiar to everybody in the room, so I'll talk a little bit about kind of what it is and how we got to where we're at and where we're going. Uh, you know, resuscitative thoracotomy, I mentioned the only contraindication when I was, was a fellow is you couldn't get the arm up to make the incision, right? So there is really, and, and that, that spectrum is still out there. There are, there are people who do not do it, and, uh, and they're very reasonably, and there are people who do it for just about every patient for various, very different reasons. One, to talk about that, the importance to that 1% and for training benefit, because I can tell you the one side benefit from doing ED thoracotomy for all those patients at Los Angeles County is you can turn the lights out in the back of a C-17 and I can get to the aorta if I need to. Now, I'm, not say, I'm not saying that in braggadocio fashion, but you, know, you have to learn how to do a procedure to do it right, because an ED thoracotomy done wrong, it can be a very disastrous thing. You can get into the heart, you can get into the lungs, and that can be a, a big problem. But some of the issues remain indications and outcomes. The best paper, if you want to look back at, we're talking about you know, all these different centers and how we've learned to understand that blunt thoracic, uh, blunt injuries really don't do too well and probably don't need an ED thoracotomy, really comes from this paper in the Journal of American College of Surgeons in 2000. And Peter re-outlined all the experience up to that time related to ED thoracotomy that he could find in the literature. The overall survival for all comers, penetrating and blunt, was 7.4%. And it really had a lot to do with where the injury occurred, the, signs, the vital signs on arrival, how long they had been without vital signs. And you can see here, this is a little bit of a confusing graph, but if you had a penetrating stab wound to the left ventricle, you did a heck of a lot better than the patients who had no signs of life and blunt injury, which is basically zero survival, zero percent survival. So these are all considerations that we needed to put forward. But there's, you know, as we've moved forward with endovascular technology, we've made some changes and we've have, we have new technologies that are available for us. And really the vascular surgery community brought this on board. If you look at the ultimate model of uncontrolled hemorrhage, it is a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. And how has the technology and the approach, how have those approaches changed in the, in the vascular world with regards to management of those? Uh, Dr. Frank Veith, among others, uh, began to really discuss the utilization of uh, reboa or, or balloon occlusion of the aorta in the setting of a rupturing or uh, tenuous uh, um, abdominal aortic aneurysm. And you look at a, a traditional uh, mortality of this, as Dr. Pevick very well outlined, is pretty bad, pretty dismal, right? Uh, but they were able to improve the 30-day mortality just a little bit, enough to encourage this as a, a potential uh, adjunct that could be utilized in this environment. And it's gained a lot of traction. We have it well practiced and versed. The kit is a little different in the vascular ER because in a trauma patient doing reboa, it's a straight aorta, hopefully with no pathology in a 25 year old. That's the ideal world. In this patient with torturous that Dr. Galante had, torturous aortic, uh, torturous iliac vessels, and an aneurysm sac, if it's intact that you have to navigate through, there's a few more toys and a it's a little higher skill set to get a balloon proximal to an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Uh, but they clearly showed us that there may be something to this. And this is not a new, actually, concept to the world of trauma. Carl Hughes was a Korean uh, Army uh, surgeon who actually did uh, placed a balloon in the aorta of three patients in Korea uh, and described it was a Fogarty balloon. But uh, what he described this, and he, none of them survived, but he did write about it. And he said, you know, I wish I'd thought to do this sooner before the patient was in profound extremis. And it was kind of one of the first uh, suggestions that this may be beneficial. And there's been a couple small smatterings, of very small experiences in the pre-endovascular area using uh, basically open occluding balloons. Uh, 1986, 13% survival in 15 patients. Uh, 
Gupta wrote in uh, Journal of Trauma in 1989, 35% survival in 20 trauma patients after Reboa, but these were kind of isolated experiences, and it really didn't gain any significant traction until the vascular world led uh, the way. And some military vascular surgeons, people like Darren Klaus, who was once here, Todd Rasmussen, they led the investigations here and really guided some of the translational research that was started at San Antonio at the 59th Medical Group and continues in earnest here at the SIF down the road, and I'll talk more about that, uh, that really showed us that this was a, a true possibility. The ultimate technique, if you want to know how to do this procedure, this is the paper to read. Adam Stenard and Todd Rasmussen basically wrote out the physiologic hypothesis that this was a valuable tech, uh, technology to be utilized in specific trauma patients, and they wrote out an algorithm. And this will look very familiar. You'll see it in the kits that we have here at UC Davis. It's the same kit that was not copyright protected, so I stole it from Shock Trauma where I was last time. Uh, and you'll see it at UT Houston. This is the same algorithm that's utilized, and it describes the zones of deployment within the aorta, the thoracic aorta for bleeding if I have a positive fast exam and a tenuous patient. We really try to stay away from aortic zone two, which is the paravisceral or uh, area of, of around the renals, the SMA, and the celiac, or for pelvic bleeding, significant pelvic or lower extremity bleeding, aortic zone three, which is uh, below that region, uh, below the last lowest renal down to the level of the aortic bifurcation. But this article lays this out very beautifully, how you can do this successfully and employ this successfully at your institution. And so people started doing it. One of the early adopters was the University of Maryland Shock Trauma, Tom Scalia, uh, one of the senior authors on this paper, will be here in two weeks, and I don't think he's going to be talking about Reboa, but he's probably played, he was a kind of a, he's an old dog, he really is, and he'll tell you as much, but he now places more Reboas than anywhere in the world, and at Shock Trauma, they have, unless you have a penetrating injury to the chest, Reboa's completely replaced ED thoracotomy at that institution. And their first six patients was kind of the hallmark paper that really opened the eyes to the trauma community. They described three zone one deployments or the thoracic aortic deployments for abdominal bleeding and three zone three deployments for pelvic bleeding. And you could see they had no reboa complications and no hemorrhage related mortality. Some of these patients, the polytrauma had head injury and other issues, but the survival was pretty impressive for the physiology they were facing at the time of arrival. And we have an ongoing registry that again, UC Davis is actively participating in here uh, in the form of the aorta re uh, registry or the aortic occlusion for resuscitation and trauma and acute care surgery. And this is a multi-center registry. Uh, uh, presently, I think we have around 18 centers. It was designed to capture patients with all forms of aortic occlusion. So ED thoracotomy, if I get into the abdomen and I do a supraciliac clamp for a, a, tra a trauma case or Reboa. And that was intentionally done so that we can look at and, and help better define what patients are most likely to benefit from which modality ultimately down the road. We capture a lot of data with this, it's, uh, demographics, uh, physiology, laboratory values, and ultimately the response and outcomes for these particular patients. We again presented kind of the last year, the, um, and this paper will come out next month, uh, at hopefully in Journal Trauma, if not this next month, the following month. Uh, we reported basically the first year and a half of experience with the first eight ACS level one trauma centers, 114 AO patients. We're now almost at around 300, so this continues to grow in leaps and bounds as the enthusiasm in the trauma world for Reboa has grown. When you look at the Reboa, it was really only being done at five centers, and I admittedly, full disclaimer here, the, the two earliest adopters were UT Houston and Shock Trauma, and they make up the bulk of that initial experience. But zone one deployment was the primarily, uh, primary zone of deployment, and we compare that to the open approaches to some degree although it's a tough comparison to make because those patient populations with a small population overall were not perfectly matched. But you can see anterior lateral thoracotomy remains the most common open modality utilized. Patients are as you would expect, right? It's trauma patients, predominantly male, predominantly penetrating, a lot of them hypotensive, uh, and particularly in the AO patients, this was the case because when, the, when it hits the fan and the patient's really sick, you go back to what you know. Rebo is a new technique, and until you adopt it, and you get practice and, and uh, experience with it, uh, you go to what you know. And so a, open AO was util, uh, aortic occlusion was utilized a lot in this uh, initial uh, series. But when we compared open and Reboa patients, what we found, at least in the initial experience over that first year and a half, was that there was really no difference in resuscitation requirements, laboratory values at 24 hours, or organ system complications. If you look at the overall mortality, again, this was not a well-matched population in the beginning. I think we're getting robust enough that we'll be able to do some more matched analysis as we move forward. But you can see a, a trend toward a slightly lower mortality in the Reboa patients. 
Uh, and uh, if you look at, at the adjusted, that was also held true. And then no, no difference in neurologic outcome. Actually, maybe a slightly better neurologic outcomes with the Reboa patients overall. Um, one of the challenges here is everybody thinks, especially as we move down to the new ER Reboa device, which I'll show in a moment, uh, which is a small cut down uh, device. Uh, it's a seven French axis. So you don't even really have to do a cut down. You can do this percutaneous. But the challenge here is that at present, you still need some open access skills. So this really does require at present a trauma surgeon, a vascular surgeon, somebody who can get into the groin and expose the femoral artery because placing something percutaneous, even with ultrasound, in a patient who has no pulse, no blood pressure, or very low blood pressure and no pulse, can be challenging. And really, we talk about, and the way we teach is to use, utilize plain film for subsequent confirmation that the wire is in the thoracic aorta. That is the standard that we teach to. But in reality, uh, external landmarks, these patients uh, basically had them placed without any imaging initially and 26%. And likely that was the more extreme uh, set of physiologies that were faced. Now there are approach specific complications with uh, either type of uh, approach. Um, pseudoaneurysm, 2.2%, uh, distal embolism and 4.4% and balloon migration and 4.4% with Reboa. But unlike some of the early Japanese experience where they didn't really treat the leg axis with respect and would leave some of these large 12 French sheaths in for 24, 36 hours without adequate follow-up and resuscitation, uh, we have not lost any limbs rel related to uh, placement of a Reboa in this country or in Canada. Uh, open, as one would expect, there's going to be some retained hemothorax, there's going to be some local wound infections requiring surgery. So there's complications for both that appear to kind of correlate in terms of their percentages and their incidence, uh, but we're going to need to move forward and continue to collect data to see if those uh, become different. Um, really, one of the criticisms of Reboa is it's a new skill set. And how long is this going to take? Every trauma surgeon thinks that they can put a clamp on the aorta with the ED thoracotomy in, what, two minutes? Two minutes. It always takes longer than you think it does. Uh, so one of the criticisms is, well, I can do an ED thoracotomy in a patient in extremis far faster than I can do a Reboa. And I think a lot of this just comes with training and experience. And if we look actually at the time durations that we noted uh, with the placement of Reboa versus open thoracotomy, there's really no difference between those two populations, at least in the initial experience. Reboa had a better mean systolic blood, higher mean systolic blood pressure. Some of those patients actually had blood pressure, so you could, they were probably a little less sick, which makes comparison a little more uh, challenging. And interestingly, there was a second AO attempt defined as I had to put, the clamp came off the aorta for the open and I had to put it back in, or the balloon came out or the wire came back. And that was actually more common in open thoracotomies in these patients. But a lot of that was the majority of patients who were doing the open were trainees. The person with their hand on the scalpel with their hand on the clamp was actually a trainee. So this is a tough, uh, a challenging skill set. And in the initial experience with Reboa, it's been primarily attendings who, and, and trained attendings through the Reboa course at uh, Maryland or other locations. But really, the best we could conclude, because this was not a well-matched population, this is our surveillance registry, so hopefully we'll be able to move forward and collect more data, is that you can have some pretty good outcomes with uh, aortic occlusion in the modern era with patient selection. There's good neurologic outcomes among the patients that do survive. The majority of Reboa patients were discharged to home. So that was a, uh, an encouragement. And this may, may represent a viable a technique to open AO techniques. There's, we have not demonstrated improved survival but it does avoid many of the complications that are traditionally associated with ED thoracotomy, and we really have to continue to study this as we move forward. But there's a lot of enthusiasm. I try to bridle my enthusiasm on this topic because I think we have to look uh, carefully at the data as we move forward scientifically, although I will admit I'm an early adopter and I prefer to utilize Rebo if the, patient pre if the situation presents, but there's a lot of enthusiasm about this skill set. The, uh, the group in London at the, uh, the, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the London Hospital Service, but they have a physician actually on their helicopters for local regional response in the London area. And they've placed these on the curb. The patient did not survive in this particular case, but they're going to get lucky at some point, and I can guarantee it'll be in the press. Where are we at in 2016 with Reboa Technique? And all of this has moved very fast in the last several years. Lower profile devices are coming out. We have increased uh, device capabilities. Now these devices can actually double as an arterial line. Uh, the group here at, uh, at the SIF is doing some really cool stuff looking at proximal arterial offloading and modalities that we can utilize. This is the new catheter device that actually was first employed, in, uh, first survivor in the world was, uh, was uh, undertaken here at UC Davis with this 7 French device, which is now an FDA approved device. It's 
As I mentioned, small access. You can basically take this out if everything goes well and just hold pressure. And you don't have to go back and close the artery. Uh, there are, uh, it has arterial monitoring port here, kind of distal, uh, that you can't see very well on the screen, but it can serve as dual, uh, dual monitoring capability of the uh, aortic pressure. There's no guide wire involved. And technically, you don't need fluoroscopy with this in trauma patients with kind of straight aortas. It's all one, uh, one night and all in few sheaths, so there's no wire that needs to be utilized. It's promising. We're still looking at this in the early experience, but it's a very promising adaptation of this technology. I'm going to talk a little bit about how things are going to move forward now, and I'm going to give credit. Luke Neff is here from the CIF. Uh, we have actually a lot of folks, uh, half of our, how many of the residents here have worked in the CIF before? Some of our Air Force residents. You see a lot of hands, right? So this is all your work and moving forward, so you should be proud of this. Uh, but the CIF is really doing some tr great translational work and really defining real time what we should be doing next. And the ultimate goal, I think, here is going to be that not just a Reboa. You know, Reboa, putting a balloon in the aorta, blowing it up or down, it's kind of like putting a clamp on the aorta. It's an all or none kind of physiology response. But the way I think we should be moving forward, and I think the data and the translational data supports this, the early clinical experience supports this, is with early partial Reboa for these trauma patients. So what does that mean? We place the balloon in the aorta. The benefits we want to get above the balloon, right? Everybody understands it's preservation of perfusion to the heart and the brain, right? preserve flow to the critical organs, but we want to stay away from the overpressure events that can cause problems. If you leave that clamp, I don't know how many of you have seen it before, but when you get uh, leave a clamp on the aorta and the patient comes back and you're not mindful and you don't take it off, you can send these patients into fulminant heart failure from which they don't recover. I've seen that, and that's one of the reasons why some trauma surgeons don't place clamps on the aorta. Tom Scalia at University of Maryland with ED thoracotomy will open the chest, he'll do a clamshell. He very rarely places a clamp on the aorta unless there's a hole in that aorta for that reason. You can also worsen TBI with overpressure. If I have a contusion, cerebral contusion and now I drive the blood pressure above that event by not being mindful of the pressure above the balloon or the clamp, that can then uh, become a very fulminant injury and actually a life-threatening and life-ending one. What kind of benefit do we want below the balloon? Optimally, you'd like to have an initial occlusion, right? We want to slow down the blood flow just enough for some of these injuries as we're trying to get surgical control, those that demand surgical control. But let's say we have a bad liver fracture or a raw retroperitoneal surface. We want to slow down the blood flow just long enough to get some clot formation, okay? And that usually takes about eight to 10 minutes, depending on the patient's coagulopathy and a lot of different factors. And then transition early to partial balloon occlusion. And what that does is minimizes the total, the total ischemic time. It mitigates the reperfusion injury risk because if we have a, con a constant low flow of blood past the critical organs, when we take the clamp or the balloon out entirely, we don't have the massive washout effect that we've all seen from tourniquet utilization, that we've seen from thoracic aortic clamps, or that clamp on the supraciliac for, say, a uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm repair. And this also has the potential, at least, and I, I'm always mindful of this wearing this uniform, to extend the duration of intervention when needed. So if we can place this at a, a smaller hospital that doesn't have profound surgical capabilities in Afghanistan, keep a casualty long enough to get to a Luke Neff at a Rule 3 hospital to save his life, that has some real-world military applications. There's been a lot of initial translational work in this area, and this is all work done to SIF. I take no credit for this besides standing up and actually presenting it. And this is one of their really cool models, the, uh, the pig model, controlled hemorrhage and class 4 shock. They randomized animals to actually no occlusion. So this is class 4 shock, significant hemorrhage in these, in these animals. No occlusion, partial occlusion, or full occlusion for 90 minutes. And they looked at hemodynamics, serum markers, and histology. And so what did they find? If you look here, the black is complete occlusion. You see a nice rise. On the left is your mean arterial pressure. That gives you a nice brisk rise in arterial pressure, right? Partial. A somewhat of a rise, and then the green is uncontrolled hemorrhage. They're going to remain in a profound hypotensive state. But look at the, at the clamp time that comes off over here on the right-hand side. I'm going to blow this up just a touch. Uh, you look at the rebound here. So the red line is the native aortic pressure prior to the installation of injury. You can see that with the rebound, reperfusion, washout, and all those toxic metabolites actually cause the patients with a full clamp the entire time to completely wash out, and those patients are going to decompensate and decompensate quickly. But look at the blood pressure response in the partial, or the blue. It stays in, hovers in the range of normal aortic uh, pressure prior to the incidence of injury. I hope that I'm describing these graphs right. I have a lot of people in the SIF today, so I'm making sure that I'm saying the right thing. Luke's giving me a thumb up. And if you look at the metabolic burden in t over time as well, look at the gray here, which is complete occlusion. This is lactate levels as measured on the left axis. 
And you can see complete occlusion results in a profound lactate response. So it's no wonder that these animals decompensate when we take the clamp off. And we can mitigate some of that and promote a lower grade washout so those metabolites do not build up by going early to partial occlusion if the patient will tolerate it. This is the, the actual vital signs uh, graph from the OR uh, from our first uh, uh, patient uh, with a survival from the prime time um, uh, ER catheter, the seven French device. It's the first survivor in the world, and AJ and Rachel have been kind enough to write this up, and it's hopefully going to be in publication soon. This graph looks a little complicated. I'm going to take out everything but mean arterial pressure to help better tell the story. So you can read the article that they've written very nicely to tell the full story. But when this patient got to the operating room, basically we had a patient with some penetrating injuries, including penetrating injuries to the chest and the abdomen, now with no chest set that was readily available. So I had the ER verbo in my hand, and we could talk about the contra potential contraindications with placement for penetrating chest injury, but it worked out well in this particular instance. I wouldn't do that every time, certainly. But we placed the Reboa. It took about three minutes and 10 seconds for a femoral cut down and subsequent access with the Reboa. We went to total occlusion for eight minutes while we were simultaneously opening the chest and the abdomen, controlling a splenic injury and a significant left lower lobe injury. And after that ensuing eight minutes, even as we were working surgically, we went to partial occlusion. And here we were able to assess that with aortic palpation. Ideally, you would have a arterial line distal to the balloon to better titrate here. But we really kind of had to go old school with aortic palpation. And ultimately, when the Reboa let down, you can see the patient didn't have that significant drop off and had a very nice washout and went to the ICU. He had some chest tube management things that kept him in the hospital for a little bit, but he went home. This was a father of six, 28 years old, went home for day 14, and a guy who was dying basically in the OR. So it was a very cool collaboration between some novel device utilization and some me learning how to use this from our translational work in the SIF. Uh, we've described kind of this technique, a lot of you may know Austin Johnson, who is one of our uh, ER thought leaders here and is very well involved with Luke and Tim and others in the lab, and hopefully this, this will be published as well in the Military Supplemental Journal of Trauma as a way forward with balloon occlusion utilization. And we don't stop there, we continue to think about better and bigger ways to utilize, more refined ways to utilize that. I think one of the things that we've developed now is that distal... We have proximal arterial monitoring with this new seven French device, but having additional distal arterial monitoring allows us to tell how much that balloon is coming down and how do we get to that first blip of an arterial waveform so that we know we're getting some flow back, but we're not blowing off the clot from everywhere by taking the balloon down completely. So how does partial reboa work? These are the basic steps. I describe them very nicely in our clinical scenario from the patients. You have about 10 minutes of complete occlusion. During that time, you can establish a distal arterial monitor. If you don't have the best, we did this with, again, aortic palpation in this case, but it, ideally you would place in a distal arterial line. You let the balloon down until you get pulsatile waveform and then stepwise balloon insufflation with pressure monitoring. And you really want to avoid that rapid increase in distal pressure and monitor the arterial pressure proximally. If they don't tolerate this, you reocclude and you start over again. So that's kind of the way forward with that. Uh, and this has some significant applications, not only in the military world, but look at this map. These are the major level one common uh, uh, critical access hospitals. There's a lot of space that is not covered on this map. And it does this technology, this seven French device that I can place in the femoral artery, allow us to transport patients who might not otherwise survive to a facility that's capable of caring for them. I think that we need to consider that as we move forward with planning. And I've already mentioned once or twice here, clear military potential applications. And this is why the DOD funds the work they do at the CIF and why they've been involved with this device from the very beginning. There are some limitations uh, to partial reboa that we need to carefully consider moving forward in this regard. You've got to have invasive monitoring capabilities. You really need to have access to resuscitation capabilities, including blood products. You need a surgeon around who can actually fix the surgical bleeding to deal with. And you really have to have, you don't think about this much, but running this balloon, it's a simple seven French balloon, but if you're gonna really truly respond real time to the physiologic response of the patient, then you need to have someone whose whole job is to do just that in many instances. I think we're moving forward with some uh, opportunities to maybe make that more of an automated process to cognitively offload the trauma team, but that's kind of a new horizon. At present, this is your best control with letting the balloon down. It's literally letting it down a cc at a time with your hand and this 30 cc syringe, maybe hooked in, in line with a 5 cc syringe to let down for more precise balloon letdown. But we really still get, you can see in the period we were letting it down here, that's kind of a jagged sawtooth response. I would really like to see a nice, clean slope 
from the point of maximum insufflation all the way down to an area that approximated normal aortic flow after we were done. So maybe we're doing it wrong. I think uh, my, my colleagues at the SIF has kind of convinced me we talk about pressure all the time and titrating these things to pressure. Maybe a better way to do it would be flow, which is familiar to most of us who have ever dealt with ECMO, who've dealt with uh, cardiac pumps or had a cardiac rotation, and you understand how some of these flow principles work. This is not a, uh, a foreign concept. If you look at when we let these balloons down, and this is again an animal model here, you let the balloon down here, you don't even start to see because of the vasospasm in some of these animal models, the recovery of any kind of distal pressure or distal flow until about two minutes in. And then when it does, it drastically overshoots from the aortic baseline. So if I have any clot over there and during that area, I'm going to get dramatic reperfusion, which is going to result in potential decompensation of the patient. And I'm going to get clot disruption, which kind of defeats the purpose of having the balloon there and is one of the challenges that we face. So we, I think what we've learned in the lab is that small changes in that balloon volume, as you can see from that last graph, really affect profound changes in flow, and it's tough to titrate the flow related to just controlling that balloon with your finger. Uh, it's crude and requires close attention, and it may result in ongoing hemorrhage. Reboa shunt is a, a, an approach that has been discussed uh, by the guys in the SIF, and it, this may look a little bit like an extracorporeal circuit. And it really is. And I'll talk about the promise that that may hold moving forward as well. But when you look at the evolution here of this, if we can control the distal flow and perfusion rate of the aorta and better regulate that, we're going to minimize distal hemorrhage, minimize distal ischemia, and mitigate, particularly with offloading and taking blood from above the balloon, recirculating it below the balloon in a controlled fashion, you mitigate that proximal overpressure. This was a proof of concept model that they utilized in the lab. I'm not going to get in the weeds on this, but basically they did a severe liver hemorrhage model. All the animals survived, severe liver, grade four hemorrhage. They had all had normalization of lactate, and six of the seven had return of normal urine output. And this really provided the rationale for kind of flow-based endovascular device, which is something that they're moving forward with at the SIF and developing in partnership in part with industry. And automation here, if we're going to regulate flow, makes a lot of sense. To some degree, aortic balloon pumps are regulated on some level, uh, beat to beat. Why can't we do this if we're going to utilize it for trauma? We've got to fight the autonomic uh, CNS and the hormonal effects, vascular tone, volume out st uh, status, cardiac output. All these things are very dynamic in the trauma setting. And unless you have somebody dedicated to minute to minute response, it's a challenge to handle. So we really need to move forward and cognitively offload the trauma team so they can do other things like stick stitches and things that... Uh, need to be uh, stitched and control hemorrhage and sur by surgical means definitively. And if you do this with automation, it doesn't actually take much. The data from the SIF suggests that uh, actually it's 5 to 10 percent of your na native aortic flow. If you can establish that kind of flow blue balloon, only 5 to 10 percent of your native aortic flow, you will completely avoid the risk of profound lactic acidosis after balloon letdown. And that's really facilitated by stable, uh, a stable approach and really facilitated by automation. So this is kind of the, we could do this right now, off the shelf. Uh, you establish the balloon, you put a contralateral femoral access, brachial access to offload above the balloon, re-deliver the blood back to the distal aspect below the balloon, and we can mitigate this very closely. To me, what this looked like, they showed me these pictures initially, that's an ECMO circuit. Right? So if we marry this in the right patients with various approaches, can we utilize, marry this with ECMO? Absolutely. Does that give us flow control? Yes. Can we now oxygenate the blood that we're delivering below the balloon? Can we warm that blood more effectively? Both of those can be facilitated. All kinds of technologies in terms of filtration. There's a, everybody's talking about, Ian's doing a lot of work on cytokines right now in the lab and their importance in trauma. And we're talking about how we can filter these cytokines that have adverse effects on the human body out this now, we're taking the blood outside the body. This gives us an opportunity to do that. And ultimately, we can administer some of these medications that people are talking about that actually uh, allow the cell to better tolerate ischemia and reperfusion. Some of those include valproic acid and hydrogen sulfide, which are very exciting kind of near, near mid-horizon kind of interventions. But all that work is being done by the CEF. My last segment here has been really just a plug for the hard work that they're doing down there. I think sometimes they feel like they're slaving in obscurity, but I can tell you the trauma world in particular is really jumping up and stepping uh, up and taking notice. A lot of residents in here participate in that, and you should be very proud and be very, feel very rewarded by that because I can tell you this is the hot topic of the trauma world, and you guys all played a very important role in that. TBI, Reboa, all kinds of technologies. I mean, look at that. they got a CT scanner. 
uh, in our lab over there now. So, I mean, it's just kind of really a cool environment to get. To. I'm, I'm happy getting to play with that and have that interaction on a daily basis. So I came close. I know Joe said I could go to 8.30. So I, I, I came within a couple minutes. A lot of exciting stuff. And I could literally, I'm a trauma vascular junkie. I could get up here and talk for days. But I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to, to share some of my passion. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, think about the first part of your uh, lecture, the treatment of uh, blunt thoracic aortic injuries. Uh, I was wondering about the uh, potential uh, outcome of uh, guidelines suggesting that uh, uh, particularly the grade two injury would not need to be treated operatively. And, and uh, <clears throat> you mentioned something in the Reboa lecture, which actually uh, triggered it, uh, you know, that's going to be, those recommendations are going to be applied in a non-resource rich environment where folks don't sure. have uh, uh, potentially IVUS and things like that. Sure. And so the consequences of misstaging the aortic injury are yeah. suddenly uh, a lot bigger. How does IVUS compare to some of the uh, sort of community imaging techniques, dynamic CT, etc.? Yeah. Well, we know from the work of Demetriades, and when they published that in 2009, I mean, it really, everybody's now using CTA. And the granularity there is pretty profound. We make a lot of our, the majority, I, I don't of our vascular, initial vascular surgery decisions for thoracic aortic pathologies based upon CTA, right? This, this, the granularity has gotten where we need to be in that regard. Ivis, yeah, they're pretty good. And Ivis is a great tool, particularly useful for those patients who can't get contrast for various reasons and really refining and detecting some of these grade one and grade two, these sub more subtle injuries, uh, and defining landing zones and all those kind of things. I try to routinely use IVUS in that setting. But again, if we don't need to be treating the one to two injuries right away, within 24 hours, if that patient can then get discharged from that facility or transferred from somewhere in Northern California to see Dr. Pevick down here or come and see him in clinic in a week, is that a better answer? Because if you look at even some of these trauma patients that have prolonged hospital courses, and the retrospective data, though, so far, from both the multi-center and single-center retrospectives, those grade two injuries very rarely progress during the initial hospitalization. But that's not to say that they won't progress in a month or two months. So we need to get them on an appropriate follow-up regimen and define which ones are going to resolve, okay, which ones were Im imaging artifacts, and uh, which ones are going to progress and re need subsequent treatment. Yeah, I, you know, that, where does that gray area begin? Again, that, the, that grade is defined upon the wall of the aortic, the aortic anatomy. If I took it in pie slice and took some slides, I could definitely tell you whether it's grade two or grade three. I think one of the discussions that be, is being undertaken is if there's a contrast abnormality that extends beyond the wall of the normal aorta, then maybe those patients are more likely to be need, treat, need to be treated in the earlier phases. If there's not that contrast internally, meaning if you have a hematoma, convex lens, then you, and it's pushing into the aorta, maybe that's not those we, we don't necessarily need to treat urgently. A lot of controversy uh, with that, and it's going to be exciting to see what happens in the next couple of years. I think we're good. All right. Good. <clears throat> Thank you.